in the past I I had a small you know tablet so I could kind of see who is remotely we're not doing that anymore Oh, okay. Kathleen, Ellen, JD, Jack, and Trish. That's great. <clears throat> well, we can start the purse. Okay. Teacher, oh, Bow Destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, Supreme One, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, Bow Destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. Teacher, Bow Destroyer, thus gone, Holy and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. When you, chief of humans, were born, you took seven steps on this great earth and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you who are wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector, to you I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you who is free from dust. Matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector, endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, field of ocean-like merits and good qualities, to the thus gone I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue, releases from the evil gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning to the Dharma that brings peace, I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path, well abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities, to the Sangha also I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge, homage to the great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage, to all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms, in all aspects, with supreme faith, I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action, accumulate virtue and goodness, subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning and clouds, look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all-seeing and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence, stirred by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the Guru, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness in the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time 
and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen, and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala, together with other pure offerings and wealth, and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O oh, my masters, my yidams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith. Accepting these out of your boundless compassion, please send forth waves of your blessings. Idam guru ratna mandala kam nir tiyami. The heart of the perfection of wisdom sutra. I prostrate to the Arya triple gem. Thus did I hear at one time, the Bhagavan was dwelling on massive vultures mountain on Rajariya, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara. How should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that in the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Shari Putra. Shari Putra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form, emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomena. There is no eye element, and so on, and up to and including no mind element and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to and including no aging and death and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond air, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth, since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared, tayata gate gate paragate parasamgate bodhisoha. Ayate gate gate paragate parsam gate bodhisoha. Shariputra, the bodhisattva, mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. 
Then the Bhagavan arose from the concentration and commended the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, well said, well said, son of the lineage. It is like that, it is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you have indicated, even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the venerable Sharidavi Putra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the worlds of gods, humans, Asuras, were highly overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan, Omahung. Did you have the request? Oh, yes, that's, I don't have that. Yeah. Sorry, the request to turn the wheel of Dharma. To fulfill the needs of all beings at their various levels of understanding, we request that you turn the wheel of Dharma, including the lesser and greater common and extraordinary approaches. Okay. Maybe I need that. We can just print that out, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Here we are. Good. So I'm trying to be loud enough for our audience here and our audience at home. So is there a way to see if everyone can hear us? <clears throat> so uh, today I'm going to start talking about our next topic. Uh, we're going to be reading Buddhist logic, <clears throat> Dharmakirti. <clears throat> People uh, can start turning on their turning in their essays that they've had to work on for the last couple of months, right? <clears throat> so, <clears throat> um, logic's really important um, because we use it all the time, uh, usually not very well. Um, you know, we, we usually think um, we can be in two places at the same time. What do you think? Is that logical? Can one thing be two places at the same time? Not if it has a certain definition in place and time, no. Um, can something be both is both be exist and not exist at the same time? No. So, <clears throat> so we study logic because um, we may have different experiences or different opinions, but uh, how things must be is, is logic. Um, the sutras and the tantras um, are pointing to certain realities, trying to describe certain experiences and certain truths. So some people think, well, I just have meditation and I um, read the sutras and maybe read um, some of the commentaries and I don't have that, I don't have to do anything else. Um, but that would be like, um, I know where I wanna go in my car, <laughs> the destination. Um, I know how to drive the car but you don't know the traffic laws. <clears throat> and this kind of um, funny historical world, politically we're going, I don't care. I just, I live in Wyoming, I'll drive down the <laughs> middle of the road. 
But logic is like um, the traffic laws, um, how things must be for it to work. So uh, Nagarjuna uses logic. We're mostly pointing to what uh, truth the Madhimikans are, are coming to particularly, but uh, logic is uh, the um, traffic rules or how you get there. So would you say you can drive both on the right and the left side of the road at the same time? No, okay. But there's a certain part of us, I shouldn't say part, clashes, misunderstandings, delusions that like um, we can simultaneously drive down the right and the left at the same time, even going different directions. <clears throat> so the logic aspect is extremely important if not only does one want to uh, clarify one's experience, but one wants to uh, reach the truth. Some people are kind of natural logicians, you know, they, um, uh, they're thinking clearly anyway, but most of us need some kind of education in um, how things actually work, how things must be for the system to function. <clears throat> the Buddhist logic is more than just um, understanding uh, karma and cause and effect. That's important. If we think we can have a cause without an effect or an effect without a cause. That's a problem, right? Well, that's uh, not logical. <clears throat> but uh, it's not enough to just know the basics, like karma, cause and effect, um, without uh, the logical uh, thinking and the logical sense. So I don't want to use just thinking. I want to use like logic is, has something to do with how things actually are or could operate. So I was a philosophy major, did graduate work in philosophy too. So I had the opportunity to to read uh, Western logic from like Aristotle, simple syllogisms up to symbolic logic. <clears throat> I didn't find it very interesting or helpful at the time because um, I was in the mind of, well, uh, I just like to meditate and um, drop my defenses and uh, experience the world directly. <laughs> I don't know, has anybody ever had that kind of thinking? Like, I'll just meditate and become completely open and then whatever I do will be um, great. <laughs> um, but once again, that's like um, not seeing that um, we can't do everything we want to do, um, and that there are actually laws of thinking and action um, that actually not will not restrict us from getting enlightenment or what we want, but will actually help us. <clears throat> So the study of Western logic is, and philosophy is, is different. So uh, when we start reading uh, the primary texts and the commentaries, um, 
people will find it generally tough going unless they uh, understand the reason why. Um, it's supposed to be tough going because from my point of view, most people are completely upside down. So it does take, because uh, we think we can be two places at the same time and something can exist and not exist at the same time. <clears throat> We'd like to have that, right? Something we'd like to, you know, have the ability to, uh, to have the excluded middle, at least experientially, right? We'd like to be able to say, yeah, I can have it, have it all. <clears throat> However, um, awakening is realizing that um, you don't really have to have it all. <clears throat> It's really great that the uh, you know, body works great that you know your your arm bends this much but doesn't bend back this way right <laughs> you don't want to have it all you don't want to be able to do everything be horrific be like some um, uh, twilight zone uh, you know from the sixties some twilight zone episode got to have it all. <clears throat> So logic, Buddhist logic, is uh, a huge uh, aid in helping us you know, be free of um, unresolvable conflicts, um, not just emotional, but uh, intellectual, that, that do determine how we actually act and what we actually experience. <clears throat> My favorite books are ones that aren't um, strictly formal logic, but like books like Logic in Everyday Life, you know, and uh, books how to do critical thinking, right? Because um, there isn't that much of that these days. <clears throat> but the uh, uh, Dharmakirti Dignaga kind of logic is. Um, doesn't seem immediately practical. <clears throat> but uh, when I was in junior high school, um, listening to like uh, health classes didn't seem very practical either, right? <clears throat> now we're paying a lot of attention. <clears throat> So when we're reading these texts and discussing them, uh, I have to go into Western logic a little bit to give us a background because we have a lot of unconscious ways we think. A big way in the West is we tend to think uh, teleological. Um, teleology is like, uh, you know, the, the logic or the logos of going the end informs what is real. So of course, um, Aristotle said everything's it's kind of positive guy, I guess. So everything is tending toward the good. I like that idea. <clears throat> um, so, but it's teleological. Everything's trying to evolve towards some uh, perfection. And uh, medieval uh, biology and medieval science um, tend to look at the world this way. Like there was a hierarchy too, things were evolving and we could easily see who was more or what was more evolved and what was less evolved. In this world culture, we can probably see that this easily, you know, played into um, 
you know, hierarchy that played into colonialism and those kinds of things, right? <clears throat> so uh, a big part of looking at um, this logic, Dharma logic, is that uh, we may be discouraged that uh, it doesn't look teleological, like we, we want to be thinking, towards what end is this going? Um, <clears throat> um, because we're uh, very much um, thinking that uh, the end um, tells us uh, more than uh, other things. And it implies that uh, there's uh, a hidden um, energy. So it's almost like an ancient Greek philosophy that acorn wants to become the oak, right? <clears throat> I don't know, do you think so? So we have some really deep-seated assumptions, a priori beginning assumptions about uh, how things should go, particularly when we come to Dharma practice and we hit up against um, our fixed beliefs when we sit down to meditate, correct? <laughs> and we hit up to our fixed beliefs uh, when we get together as a community and try to do projects and run a temple, don't we? Particularly Americans kind of like um, strong individualism. <clears throat> um, and we end up against uh, difficult ideas when we're just reading uh, tenants or um, the commentaries, right? But it's nothing like logic. <clears throat> I don't know why that is. I mean, we could have a discussion about that, you know. Um, <clears throat> we will run up against um, a feeling that it, it doesn't make any difference, um, except when we examine our behavior, others' behavior, our misperceptions, um, you know, particularly now, we get to see, wow, actually, a large number of people don't think logically, right? <laughs> um, and on top of that, I don't uh, know much uh, math or statistics either, you know. I like my big math or statistics person. I hated it in a way, but um, there's something learned there, don't you think? Something to learn if you learn, you know, it's, it's something statistically significant. Um, so, um, it is scary that uh, there's some breakthrough uh, COVID, right? Um, it's still uh, statistically quite small, because it doesn't feel small if we're the person or the loved one, but Probably it has a lower percentage statistically than the relationship between automobiles and accidents or something, right? So, um, we need to examine exactly how we make decisions and we think um, along process rather than just deciding 
on a conclusion that we'd like to achieve and then rationalizing our way to get there. Isn't that how we normally do it? Hmm. So in, in Western disciplines, we do have some uh, things that are similar to Buddhist kind of ways of thinking. Uh, these, in my limited view, are still you know, the scientific method, Western scientific method. And um, you have to go through a certain kind of process to arrive at something that maybe isn't 100% true all the time, but might be pretty much true. Gravity. Um, and then this, uh, I don't know much about law, except um, I know after having gone to court a number of times, um, seems to be uh, a lot about process, right? Rather than what I've decided ahead of time, what, what you know, what the right or just thing. Isn't that so? So you know, you've got to follow this procedure, and that's called procedure. And well, they didn't introduce, they introduced some evidence that wasn't you know, correctly obtained. So it's out, right? Isn't that so? <clears throat> but that's not right. <laughs> so, you know, uh, <clears throat> so, you know, let's go against that, you know, we'll just um, break somebody out of jail or, or just throw them in jail ourselves or something. <clears throat> so Buddhist logic is um, very much like that kind of medical procedure or legal procedure. Like, it isn't just like, well, that's nice, but it has nothing to do with how I run things. Um, uh, likewise, in psychology, you know, psychologic, um, when I'm in my role as therapist, I, I'm really much more interested in how people uh, are self-aware to how their process runs rather than um, just the conclusion. Okay, so um, the process of how people arrive at their you know, world is, is important in psychology and dharma, and it has a certain logic to it. So I don't want people to just um, take a helicopter to their happiness <laughs> or some kind of uh, uh, clear button. I just want it to go away. Those are, that's probably the most frequent. I just, I just want this to go away. And you have a button. <laughs> so uh, the Buddhist logic is very much akin to following medical procedures, like somebody obviously wants the pain to go away, or they want some new heart, or liver, or kidney, kidney transplant, or whatever, but um, you have to follow a certain procedure. It's annoying because, you know, some procedures are um, very difficult and don't turn out well, but we have to follow them. Procedures that um, we particularly don't like are bureaucratic organizational procedures, right? <laughs> like, why don't we just fix that or something? Um, so, uh, but there's a certain logic in how we do things. So the logic we're reading, uh, getting acquainted with, um, is not seen as an unnecessary um, uh, function, but will vastly help us negotiate our own self-healing. Because in Dharma, you know, the Buddhists teach they can't reach in and do your process for you. 
So uh, in Dharma, in this sense, even though um, we receive teachings, we still have to apply it from our side. It's not just a passive thing. So uh, the logic that we're working with um, lets us into, okay, here, here's how uh, medical procedures work. Here's how, you know, legal systems work or litigation goes or is made, uh, how laws are made. Here's how scientific research is conducted. Here's, you know, a double blind um, research project. <clears throat> Meditation and internal states are very um, uh, difficult to do uh, research on, don't you think? Um, uh, you know, what, what counts as a placebo group for shamatha meditation? Alan Wallace, who's put a lot of thought into this and a few other people, I think there's a Chalmata project at Davis, right? So, um, <laughs> I guess some people like, and there have been different versions, like, we're really going to teach you the right way to do Chalmata, and then you're going to report on your experiences, and then we're going to teach you nothing. <laughs> um, is it ethical to teach people the wrong way to meditate, to see, or nothing? So, um, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, so procedures, how we arrive at our conclusions are really important. So in Dharma, as professional bodhisattvas, I want you to know how you got there. Um, so uh, it's nice to know the kind of summit. Um, you could go over the summit with saying certain Mahamudra or Zochens or Madhyamaka phrases, right? But do you know how you got there? <clears throat> um, you got there by traveling a road, but you can't just travel any road. You can't just say, well, I want to get to enlightenment. I'll just have any experience that comes along and be open to it. Does anybody have that philosophy? <laughs> Didn't we used to? I don't know. Maybe I did. Like, I'll just be open and do anything. Um, well, it didn't work for me. Maybe it worked for some people. It doesn't work, you know. Just do anything. Drive down any road and you'll get to San Francisco. Might end up in Louisiana, right? So we can't just say, um, have any experience and then you'll um, get there. It's not quite that easy. So we use logic as a way to uh, make the path safer and actually quicker. So I'd like to take a few uh, comments. I think logic has to be really interesting, um, but uh, it can be boring. <laughs> Are maps boring? I don't know, do people like maps? I like maps. <clears throat> <clears throat> Someone's trying to say something, maybe. There's Elizabeth. Miss Ellen, I have a question. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. I really liked what you said. Uh, it's a little bit, maybe, narrow question for your topic, but. 
that we pay, we focus a lot on towards what end, you know, we focus on some ultimate outcome. And I do that a lot. And I don't think I ever thought that there was any other way to do it. Um, and you said something like, um, we're thinking that the end provides mo more information than something else. And I thought, I found that really thought provoking, but I was wondering if you could give examples of what some of those alternative things might be that could pro be providing more, maybe more valuable information. Uh, alternative in what way? Well, rather than just like the ultimate goal, you know, for the sake of something, um, some outcome, maybe you mean like experience along the way or yeah. relatedness or I don't know. Um, it's just, it's like, wow, if it's not going to be just the, the end outcome, then it must be something else. And what else could it be? Yeah, it's, it's um, uh, it's going to be basically the process. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, how, uh, uh, and how we envision that process is, is really important. Um, <clears throat> So it's a little bit different than karma or just cause and effect. We could say, I need to have the motivation to climb the mountain. Uh, I need to have the right equipment, so have the effect of walking over the right snow or something. But um, uh, logic is working on the level of delusion, actually. So. Um, uh, you know, like talking to people these days, it's just samsara, but, um, <laughs> uh, you know, if somebody says, uh, um, I am really motivated to climb to the summit. I bought all the, uh, well, let's say they say, I attained the summit. <laughs> and you said, oh, um, what, what route did you go? And they said, I uh, took a route, you know, this route. And you go, that, that route isn't on the, that, that's not on the mountain. That's, you know, if you're climbing Everest, that, that's a route up, you know, set of views, <laughs> you know, or something. And, or they're saying, uh, I, I attained the summit and you go, well, why do you say that? And they say, because I thought about it. You go, well, that's not possible, right? So uh, logic exposes that the process has a gap in it. See? So when People make outrageous claims um, that don't conform to actual real experience. You can't always just say um, that's you know that's a silly experience. You can say that that's a silly experience, but um, it is possible to show that they couldn't have that experience. Is better, right? Yeah. <clears throat> or you can just say, well, you, you had that experience and that's weird. <laughs> or Mazel Tov, good for you. But um, you can't, you know, you, you just have to let most people go their way like that. But if people, if two of the parties, for example, or even one, but best two, have both studied logic, they could go, yeah, I had that. Wow, that's that's great. I had that experience, but um, that when I examine it logically, not just go into the experience, examine it logically, um, that um, that can't have happened. Right. 
like, oh, that, that, that can't have happened, that was a dream. Or that must have happened, that, that must be the way things are. <clears throat> so it feels like a different mental thing, so logic doesn't always feel experiential for people that are really experience freaks, or, you know, like everything I've got to personally experience, but um, actually, it's, you know, when we say uh, uh, wisdom seeing emptiness, uh, uh, primordial wisdom seeing nature of mind, we think that we think of that as some experience, right? I felt it in my body, would say California style. But um, actually, it has an element of logic because you, you see that something must be so. so. For those people that have come to the Mahamudra and Dzogchen retreats we've done, uh, then they, you know, deciding on one point and one point only from Pataramshi's commentary on Dharam Dorji's three points. That's not an experience of, you know, a normal experience. That's, this has to be it, right? Why not? <clears throat> so the um, logic in the process um, can let us know that not only are we there, we've reached our destination, but um, uh, like if, uh, <laughs> One of my professors in college or grad school kind of said, well, if the only way you can step is step south, then where are you? What do you think? Logically, you can only, the only way, any, if in any direction you step is south, then where would you be? You must be on the North Pole. Right? No? <laughs> yes. <laughs> because when we um, have uh, an interesting, uh, get to an interesting part in our Dharma training and practice, um, there, there is not an, uh, an experiential reference to say that ties up with, I'm at the North Pole. You have to go, you have to sometimes think that, oh, I keep walking south, my registered south, whatever thing you have, you, I must be at the North Pole. And then you sink into it, you see. We do have the experience of being at the North Pole, but it must also have this uh, ability to recognize the logic of like I'm going Everywhere I go is south, so I must be at the North Pole. Then there's like complete certainty, right? You both, you have that like, wow, or, you know, or you know you're at the top of the mountain when everywhere you look, you see space, right? Or you know um, you're kind of out of the box whenever, you know, if you're in cramped, uh, you know, sometimes people get, uh, you know, stuck in things, <laughs> literally, physically, you know, fall down well, you know, and they get so conditioned. So you have to, well, you're, you're, you're out. It's like trauma work, you know, like swing your arms. Are you hitting anything? Right? No, you're out. <laughs> right? So can someone can say, well, my experience is I'm still trapped. It's my experience, I'm still trapped. Uh, I can feel it, I can, you know, I can feel it, trapped. Don't tell me I'm not trapped. You know, we're looking at the person, this is like from my kind of uh, center, center for Psychiatry, Heritage Jokes, Schmick days, like, okay, so, you know, I'm trapped, I go, Swing your arms, you know. No, I won't, I won't. But then you, you know, you try to kind of, you know, you 
you do something so they have to swing their arms, right? And then it's like, does it make sense that you could swing your arms if you were still stuck? And then a person has to change, you see. So it's like that. So, um, so a lot of times people think they must have uh, an experiential sense, and in a sense like waving your arms, but you have to point to, does it make sense that you could wave your arms if you still were, you know, stuck in that, you know, cave or something, right? Maybe that's a longer answer than Ellen wanted. I don't know. It's like that. Is that helpful? Helpful at all? <clears throat> yes, that was helpful. Thank you. So, a really good question to always ask ourselves. <laughs> Like, does that make sense? You know, I mean, just in general, like, it, does that make sense? <clears throat> um, you know, just that elemental kind of thing, because, um, you know, does it make sense that something would happen that quickly, or does that make sense that something would um, be two places at the same time? We just have a few more minutes for tonight, so um, see anybody else. Karen, Karen has a question. Ah, okay. Um, I guess I'm a little bit confused by this because I mean, are you saying when you talk, you've talked in the past about kind of the dreamlike nature of our lives and you know sometimes I can't apply logic to what I experience because I don't have data on that particular experience in my database in my head to you know that and so does that make it not real the wonderful thing about um, learning logical process is we don't need additional data. See, it doesn't, like, if you said, I went up a route to the top of the mountain and the route doesn't exist, we don't have to go and see if you actually got to the top of the mountain or not. I mean, so then are you talking about logic in terms of define if someone's claiming an endpoint of some kind? Um, I'm guess I'm thinking about even in process, you know, I guess I'm confused. <laughs> Thank you for Sorry. being honest. Yeah, it's difficult <laughs> because, um, you know, we, we, we sometimes don't know, uh, should we gain more experience? Or, you know, do we, do we need to keep climbing, so to speak? Uh, so if we haven't had a prior experience, we're unable to match our present experience against our prior experience, isn't that right? Right. Like they say Gabi Dharma, right? So uh, that's where we, we need that kind of logical check, like, I don't need to match it because I don't need to keep on replaying, uh, you know, like every time, you know, it's like, what if somebody for 20 years went, you know, I went up and got on my dog sled and got my compass and, um, but I never found the North Pole, you know, and so, well, weren't you up there five years? And yeah, and, you know, every time I, walked the uh, you know, compass said I was walking south. I'm saying, well, that's because you're at the North Pole. And they go, but I didn't experience the North Pole. See what I'm saying? 
but they go like, <laughs> oh my gosh, I got, I'm, I got to be at the North Pole. Then what, what do you think would happen? What do you think would happen then? You know, you find it like it sinks in. Like, but uh, most people, because they haven't, they don't have that ability to train the prajna, the jhana, and logic. Um, they they keep on doing these experiments, hoping that one more experience of the same kind will just kick them over, right? You know, so so people like that can really you know be many lifetimes. They think, well, I, I just need to have one more good experience, and then um, <clears throat> I'll feel good about myself. So a story that I like to tell, sorry, I'll have to tell it again. Um, so one time a psychiatrist friend of mine invited me to a self-esteem group that he was running. You've heard this story before. So um, this is back when people were actually talking about self-esteem. Anybody remember that? Like we, you know, this self-esteem. So like people would say, my self-esteem is high, it's a nine because of X, Y, Z. Kind of makes sense, right? You know, like it's high because, you know, and went around like that until finally we got to the last person, a female, and she said, um, my self-esteem is a 10. And I go, WTF, like, what, what's the evidence that it's 10? It's better be good. And, I've told people what, what did she say? No one knows? What would you say? <laughs> <laughs> it's 10 because I say so. Oh, okay. okay, because it's a performative utterance. <laughs> it's not based on evidence. Our self esteem is not based on evidence. It's illogical to base your self esteem about on what happens to you. It's stupid. <laughs> it's illogical because the logic is it's a performative utterance it is true because you say it because you're the only one that can access that there's no need to have any you know experiences that confirm that it's a 10 because you say so likewise it could be a two because you say i feel like i'm an idiot so just by saying it you can well, i can feel like an idiot don't need any evidence right <laughs> All right, we have to close up here. So we need to get home. So, um, well, well, I'll look forward to people that are writing their essays on um, Swatantrika and so forth and good nature. So, I like experience-based things, but some things are just because we say so, and some things are like the North Pole. You know you're there when everywhere you go is south. All right. Okay. Thank you, Lama. Um, Dedication. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may quickly attain the state of a guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. <clears throat> may the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more in the land encircled by snow mountains you are the source of all happiness and good all powerful chen resik tenzin yatso please remain until samsara ends may the teachings of the buddha flourish and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever May all migrators achieve happiness and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokita Shivara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vashrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Songkhapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Losang Drakpa, I make request at your holy feet. Oma, thank you. Yeah.